I will switch to English to introduce uh, Joseph Cole, who is uh, coming from Leipzig. Uh, Professor Cole is transitioning from Leipzig to St. Andrews University, where his, his position is now, and he's on the, the way to transition his laboratory. And, um, um, well, uh, it's even hard to begin to cover the range of studies that Professor Cole has been doing in the domain of ape cognition. Uh, together with Professor Tomasello, he's one of uh, Europe's uh, most prominent specialists, I would say, of uh, ape cognition in many different domains. Following a PhD at Emory University, he went through different labs in Europe and concentrated in Leipzig. A primate uh, laboratory, and, and uh, the papers reflect a diversity of interest in the domain of communication, but especially in the domain of theory of mind. I think that would mm -hmm. be uh, perhaps the central point of your research, but also in other domains, such as, you know, what can apes understand about uh, mathematics? And I think this is uh, what you are going to tell us about uh, yes. today, what, yeah. when math trump logics from the apes yeah. perspective. Thank you very okay. much for Thank for you. Being. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in this fantastic auditorium and this great institution. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, my interest is primate cognition. I'm interested about how primates, but also how other species think. How, when they confront problems, what kind of cognitive mechanisms uh, they engage to solve these problems. And what I would like to show you today is a surprising finding, something that when we found it the first time, we thought, well, probably it's a fluke. This is, this is kind of surprising. But then we found it again and again in different domains, in different tasks. And I would like to share this, what I think is an exciting, uh, uh, an interesting finding, an exciting finding, and a surprising one too. And it's a finding that comes at the crossroads between math and logic. Obviously, we are not talking, when we are talking about non-human primates, we are not talking about formal math and formal logic. But what I will try to show you today is some of the operations, some of the cognitive processes that they use to solve some problems that to deal with quantities, the amount of food that there is in a particular location, and also the kind of processes that they use to to deal with qualities, with kinds of objects. And it's at the crossroads of these two that we will find a struggle between the two. So to, if you want to forget everything about this talk, remember this painting by uh, Francisco de Goya, because it illustrates this struggle that I'm, I'm mentioning, this place where their cognitive abilities used to operate on quantities appear to collide with their cognitive abilities that are used to solve logical problems. Obviously, this is something for humans. They represent two very important aspects of thought, and especially of abstract thought. Both Descartes and von Leibniz, both were mathematicians and logicians. They were interested in philosophy, and they were interested in mathematics. So there is some connection between these two. And what I would like to show you today is how, in this particular case today, how this connection uh, leads to some surprising results. My interest is not to show you that they are capable, the non-human primates in particular, I'm going to focus mostly on, on the great apes, on non-human non great apes. It's not to show you that they are doing the same things that we are doing. My main interest is to show you that some of the precursors, some of the skills that we use to develop our uh, advanced mathematical and logical abilities also have some basis on the behavior and the cognition of uh, non-human animals. And as I said, I will focus mostly on the great apes. Now, Trying to tell you about logic and, 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 and uh, mathematical-like skills, it is not a proposition without risk. It is not a proposition without risk because about, about 100 years ago, there was this horse, this horse here, and that was Clever Hans. 
And this horse was, uh, was thought to be capable of doing some advanced mathematics. He was a genius of the time. This horse could be presented with problems, the square root of some quantity, and this horse would look at, at the problem and then it would be able to produce a solution. The way it would produce a solution was, was tapping with his hoof on the floor and he would count the correct answer and when it reached to the correct number, it would stop and of course everybody would be amazed. Later on it was discovered that Clever Hans was clever but not in a mathematical sense. What Clever Hans was able to do was very good at reading the subtle cues that his audience produced because the audience, not Hans, knew the answer to the question and then by reading these subtle cues he was able to produce the correct answer. What I'm going to tell you today is not about this kind of mathematics, which is fake mathematics. I'm going to show you something, not something as advanced as, you know, um, arithmetic of very advanced kinds, but something much more humbler, but I'm hoping to show you that much more grounded on science. So the outline for today is as follows. First, I would like to show you some basic operations. The, some, I'm going to present you some of the most basic things that one can test and one can ask what kind of questions one can ask for non-human uh, non -human animals. And we will focus on basic operations in terms of quantities, how they deal with quantities. Are they capable of choosing the larger of two quantities? And if so, what cognitive mechanisms they use? And second, are they able to deal with kinds, and in this case, this is the part of logic, are they able to do some logical operations? And as I said, we'll start very simple with some of the most basic uh, cases. And then I will present two cases, two examples, where these two abilities, the ability quantitative cognition and, uh, and uh, so mathematics and logic collide, where they come into conflict. And each of them produces different solutions, and then we will see how the subject solves the problem. Think about the problem. The subject wants to maximize the amount of food available, and then the subject has to decide, does it use a quantitative estimation algorithm, or does it use an algorithm that involves logic? As we will go through these problems, you will see what they are. One thing that is important uh, to me today is that you get a good sense of how these experiments are conducted. So I have some videos that I will show you to see how, it, how it's done. I was saying when math and logic collides, I will give you two examples. Then we will have a take home message. What is the main thing I would like you to remember? And finally, because I told you we will do some, we will start with basic operations. I will also show you something about further direction. Some of the things that we know that now individuals of different species can do, which go beyond these very simple, very basic operations with which I will start my talk. But before I do that, I think it's important that when we talked about the cognitive mechanisms that individuals use to solve problems, we always keep an eye on what are these cognitive mechanisms used for? What kind of problem they are trying to solve? In terms of operations of quantities, for instance, one thing that has been documented is that these abilities are used for territorial defense. This is something that has been documented with lions and also documented in chimpanzees. And the lions, in, in, in these studies, they will hear vocalizations of neighboring groups, and then depending on the number of individuals identified in those vocalizations, they will approach the potential intruders, or they will retreat from the potential intruders. So if there are two lions or three lions, and they hear four or five roaring in the distance, what they typically do is they retreat further into their territory to be safer. But if what they hear is one or two lions, therefore the listeners are outnumbering the potential intruders, they do exactly the opposite. They go in the direction of the intruders. 
This is a risky business because if you make a mistake, you can be in serious trouble. If you estimated that there was one or two individuals, and when you reach that point where the vocalizations came from, you encounter seven or eight, and you are just with two, you, are, you approach them with just two of your, uh, of, your, of your companions, then you are in deep trouble. So it is very important to keep this, uh, to, this is a, a, a serious problem, it's a problem that, they, that animals of different species should deal with effectively. Another problem, perhaps one that is more common, is that of feeding efficiency. Individuals, they very often, they have to choose between different food sources, and they have to decide of two or more different food sources which one they can, um, is going to provide more energy. In some cases, this, this involves deciding the bigger quantity is in that direction, but it's farther away. So individuals very often, they have to combine different sources of information. They have to combine how much food is in a particular location, but how far away it is. And these are operations that they need to do to forage efficiently. So, there are, there are other operations that they can do on quantities, but these are some of the problems that they face in the field. Of course, when we bring the animals into the lab to try to tease apart what are these cognitive mechanisms, one can do some, some experiments in the field, and, and you saw some of the work, uh, elegant work of Klaus Uber Buller uh, last week on this. But there is a point where the studies in the field, in order to ask some questions, we need to bring we need to have some more experimental control. And what I'm going to show you today is one of the most basic paradigms that has been used to investigate, first of all, do individuals are capable of distinguishing different quantities? And second, if they do so, what cognitive mechanism is responsible for their responses? This is a task. It's got, it's got different names. It's called a relative, a relative numerousness task. And what it does is an individual is presented in the lab, is presented with two dishes with different amounts of food. And the subject has to decide which one it, it wants. One good thing about this task is you do not have to train individuals to pick the one that has more. They naturally like that. More is better. Okay? And now you present them with, with the different quantities and you see which one they choose. So I have a video here that illustrates how, task is how the task it's presented to the chimpanzee, so this is Esther Herman, and she is behind the screen. Here we have the chimpanzee. Behind the screen, she's presented the two quantities, and now she's going to reveal the quantities. Now the chimpanzee is taking a good look at what's in the contents in, on each of those dishes, and now Esther is going to show, go, and this is the choice of the chimpanzee. You don't really need to train chimpanzees with this. They do it naturally. Okay, so that's, that's the choice, and that's the food that it gets, the other quantity it doesn't get. So subjects try to, to maximize the quantity, and what you saw is what is called a simultaneous presentation. If you, if you notice, the subject was able to see at the same time the two quantities. Okay, so in a sense, what you need there, or the only thing that you could potentially need is a perceptual mechanism. You see the two quantities, and then you decide. But individuals can deal with harder problems, can deal problems of this type. You start with two dishes that have a lid on. At this point, the subject doesn't know where the food is located and how much in each dish. And then what you do is you show them one. They can take a look at that. And then you cover it. And then you show them the second one. And then you cover it. Notice that unlike the previous experiment, in this case, the subject, in order to decide which one's got more, has got to first create a representation of the two quantities and then mentally compare them. At no point during the trial, the two quantities were visible simultaneously. This is important because here a purely perceptual mechanism could not do the work. You need representation needs to be an important part, and you need to be able to compare these two quantities. Obviously, if you think about animals foraging in the wild, we expect these mechanisms to exist because for many species, the resources are not present right there, right now, 
they are distributed across time and space, and they need to have a mechanism to deal with that distance, with that uh, discontinuity between time and space. And this is what cognition does for them. Now, another way that you can present this problem is, you show this one. Now, what about, think about this problem. It's more or less easy or more or less hard. But say, if I reduce the number of pieces in one of the dishes, now this problem is much easier. You, but just looking quickly, you can see which one's got more. Okay. This is something that has been investigated. And what people have done is they had varied the different quantities between the two dishes. This has been tested with a number of studies, with a number of species, primates, uh, different species of birds, different species of fish. Um, it's been studied um, at great length. One finding that you find in the literature, not every study, but many, many studies, what they find is that the, the, the ability to select the larger of the two quantities is a function of the ratio between the two quantities. The ratio of the two quantities is simply taking the smaller quantity divided by the larger quantity. The smaller the ratio, the higher the probability that subjects will choose the larger of the two dishes. The closer they are the two quantities, the closer the ratio, the closer the ratio is to one, then the probability is that subjects will not be able to distinguish. This is a mechanism, an analog magnitude system that has been seen many, many times. Uh, it applies to a number of species, to a number of problems, and it works really well across a range of, of, uh, of quantities, but it's not very exact. It can apply to a large number of quantities, but it's not. But it, it introduces some noise because the representation that this produces is an approximate representation. Now, this is something that, as I said, many non-human animals do. Also, uh, children about two, between two, two and a half year olds that still don't have formal counting abilities, you can present the same problem. And this is a study where we compare chimpanzees and orangutans. You see very similar results. You also get a nice signature of the type of the ratio, okay? So this is one of the most basic tasks that has been used to study um, the ability to deal with quantities. And we also know what is the, the mechanism, the cognitive mechanism that is most likely to explain the, the, the pattern of results that we observe. Operations on kinds. Feeding efficiency, we already saw it in the previous one. But for feeding efficiency, operations on kinds is also important. For instance, in this case, we have a chimpanzee that is eating um, some prey animal, and uh, there are two others that are looking. Okay? Now, if these two individuals that are looking, and, are not, and in this case they are not getting any food, if these two animals knew that the prey that they were seeking at the beginning was not the prey that this individual caught, what these individuals could do is to continue searching. That means the prey, the type of prey that this individual is eating is not the same type of prey that still is available somewhere. If an individual is able to keep track of their objects of different kinds, then it can start to engage in another number of operations. These are not operations necessarily that are about quantity, but about quality. If you know that prey A is here and prey B is over there, and prey A has been taken, you better go there to find prey B. Prey A is not going to be available if you are capable of reasoning that that prey that is being held by this individual is the same one that you saw over there. And therefore, given that this individual has it, it's not going to be over there. If you, this is the, one of the most basic logical operations that you can engage in. And if you are able to do that, you can solve a range of simple problems. If it applies to feeding efficiency, it also applies to uh, reproductive tactics. So it's not something that operations on kinds only have to do, only solve problems in the feeding domain, but also in reproductive tactics. Imagine that you are an, an individual that is courting some females, 
but the dominant animal is keeping an eye on you. Okay? And here we are going to make a link with theory of mind. If you know that these two females have gone in a particular direction that now the dominant cannot see, it is safe to approach these females to try to mate with them. So here, by combining the abilities that come from theory of mind, mind reading, with logic, basic logical operations, you can solve problems. And again, just like the territorial defense example that we had before, making a mistake here can be tricky, can be risky, because then the dominant animal will come after you, and you don't want that. One of the most basic tasks that has been done to investigate the, the, some of the, the, the most, I would say, the most basic operation is a task that is called object individuation. And in this task, it's very simple. I mean, there are, different, there are different versions. I will show you two different versions. One version is this. You have this big box, and then you have a chimpanzee over there. And what this chimpanzee can do, it can insert the hand into this box, and it can search for food. Okay? If it finds food, it can eat it. There are two conditions in this task. One condition is called the expected condition. The chimpanzee sees a banana go in. And when now the chimpanzee is given a chance to search inside this box, what it extracts is a banana. Okay? So it saw a banana go in, it searches, it finds a banana, and now um, the question is, uh, after this chimpanzee is given a, a chance to search again, will they search again? In the unexpected condition, we have something that starts very similar. The chimpanzee sees a banana go in the box. Now they search, but what they find now is a bunch of grapes. And now the question is, when given an opportunity to search again, will they search? If the chimpanzee expect, expects that the bananas are still there because what has extracted is something that is different from what it went in, it could reason that the bananas still have to be in. This is some of the results with the problem that I just showed you. This is when the thing that you extract is expected. You saw a banana go in, you take a banana out. This is the, the frequency of searches. Compared to the frequency of searches when you saw a banana go in and you get a bunch of grapes, you, take a, you, you, you find a bunch of grapes in. As you can see, there is a difference between these two, which this means is that individuals are taking into account and they are expecting to find something else if what they saw go in is not the same thing that go out, goes out. You can do the same thing, but instead of using property kind, you can use it also with different now we use the same type of food. This is going to be a link with the quantitative abilities that we mentioned earlier. Now what you can do is if you place one piece of food, let's say a banana goes in, and then the subject searches and finds a banana, you can measure how long, for how long do they keep searching. And you compare that to a condition in which one banana goes in, and before the subject searches, a second banana goes in. Now the subject searches, finds one banana, and the question is, will it continue searching? If it continues searching in the two object condition more often, significantly more often than in the one object condition, it means that the subject is expecting a second object. <clears throat> what you saw is the modern instantiation of this problem, but there are other, there is, a, there is an, I'm going to show you another way to present this task. And here what you will see, you will see a bonobo in what we call a magic task. This is a task originally designed by uh, Tinklepaw uh, in 1928, and here you are going to see, hopefully, there, okay. So what you have here is a cup. This is one of those magician cups that is have a, a false bottom. And then what the Bonobo is going to see here is going to see a grape go in. Now the experimenter uh, covers the cup, 
And when it opens it again, now there is a, um, there is a carrot there. Okay? So it saw a grape go in, and a carrot is extracted. And the, the grape is not here anymore. So now look at what is the reaction of the bonobo. So it takes the carrot. They like carrots like they like grapes. Now, they prefer grapes, of course. Grapes are, are yummier. They, they like them better. But if you give them a, a carrot, they will eat it. No problem. But now, after this bonobo has taken, look, it takes a look at the cup, and now takes a look again. Okay? So one of, the, one of the indications that it is used, I'll show you the, the movie again. What the bonobo does here is when it extracts something that is not the same thing that went in, it takes another look. So the grape goes in, it's covered, a banana is extracted, and now it takes a look there, and now it's going to take another look and another look there. So even though it has gotten some food, somehow the food that it's received is not the same food that it went in and is able to uh, distinguish between these. Juliana Breuer and I tested uh, the great apes and dogs, and we found very similar results. Dogs also expect to see, the, the, the expect to find the same thing that went in. These are two, perhaps, the most basic abilities in terms of um, quantitative skills and uh, qualitative. And now I'm going to present you with two tasks. And this is, I think, the really fun part of this talk, the, the, the part that I found very surprising, incredible. OK, so let me start with the following example. You go to a store, and you want to buy a TV. Okay? And the salesperson tells you you have option one of this nice flat screen TV. Or you have this other option, which is exactly the same TV, not a difference. But this one comes with a hair dryer. Okay? So you can choose. You want option one, or you want option two. I would say most people, if we were to ask, you would say, well, I take option two because uh, the uh, hair dryer comes for free, right? OK. So this task has been given to apes, not with TVs and hair dryers. Don't get me wrong. It's been tried with primates. And they are offered option one, bananas, and option two, identical bananas plus carrots. Now, carrots, as I told you before, this is something they like, they eat, but it's not their favorite food. Bananas are much better. Okay? When you give them this option, the surprising thing, when I saw those results, I could not believe it. In one study that tested macaques and chimpanzees, they found that the subjects were indifferent. When you give them option one, one, one piece of banana, option two, an identical piece of banana plus a piece of carrot, the apes and the monkeys, they did not show a preference for this. So if they went to the store, they would not prefer the TV plus a hair dryer. A second study was done and found, in fact, that they prefer the smaller quantity. This is really surprising, because I've been telling you about how good they are at estimating quantities and extracting, extracting the energy, et cetera, et cetera. So how come are they responding in this seemingly difficult to understand manner? There are different reasons why, different, different explanations why they, they were, uh, the, the, the authors of these papers produce different explanations. For instance, this one, they argued that it takes less time to eat the banana because there is less food, and therefore the trial comes earlier. So they are trying to minimize their waiting time, and by doing that, they are choosing this option because they have less work to do. Another explanation that has been proposed is the reason we find this is because subjects do not estimate the total value of the food. What they do is they do some sort of an average. So they calculate the average of these, and the average of these, and the average of these is lower than these. And this is why they choose that other option. Now, 
this is a surprising result. As I was telling you, when I saw it, and if it was not just one paper, and in these papers there were multiple experiments, I could not believe it. So we tried to do the same thing. So we presented subjects, again with the two options, a banana and a banana and a carrot, and we got the same results to our big surprise. What you have here, uh, here you have the proportion of trials that subjects selected the option with more items. And as you can see, this is 50%, this is indifference, and you can see that subjects were basically not distinguishing very much. There is not a significant difference between any of the preferences scores. So here you have, we did this study with uh, all the great apes. We had uh, bonobos, chimpanzees, uh, orangutans, and gorillas. And what we found is none of the species showed a preference for, um, for the option with more. By the way, if you just give them a carrot, as you saw in the video, they will eat it. It's not that they don't like carrots. They will take it. Now, this was very puzzling, but one thing that we decided to do is let's see whether we can figure out what's going on. And one thing that we thought is that perhaps this has to do with something that I showed you earlier, is that subjects are very good at estimating the value of food and they use some sort of analog magnitude mechanism. Let me explain. So what we did is we presented them with other types of food to see what would happen. One thing you need to know about carrots and bananas is that even though they will eat both, there is a massive difference between the value of these two items. So we presented them with items that they were closer in value. So we presented them option one is a piece of banana, option two is an identical piece of banana plus a grape. And here, even though they were not massively going for the option with two items, we started to see a change. What we started to see is that chimpanzees and orangutans especially, they were starting to show a clear preference, a significant preference for the option with more items. It is interesting that, and you, would, you, you, may, you may wonder, why chimpanzees and orangutans? Well, as it turns out, chimpanzees and orangutans are the fruit specialists in the great apes. These individuals really need fruit to survive. I mean, the, the gorillas, they can survive on not so much fruit, and the bonobos, in case of need, they can turn to uh, more staple food of the type leaves, what is called terrestrial herbaceous vegetation. It's not strictly food, it's not strictly, uh, it is food. It's not a strictly um, uh, fruit, but they can survive. The chimpanzees and the orangutans have a much harder time doing that. Okay, so we see already a change in these two species. And then one other thing that we did is now we had an alternative with grapes compared to banana and grapes. And here we see a difference in all species. Here, all species prefer the option with banana and grape. Notice that the components are not the same, uh, sorry, the components are the same between these two conditions. The only difference is in what combination they are presented. So whether we find a preference for the option with more items or not seems to depend on the type of items involved. Our explanation for these results, I, I told you this earlier, has to do with this. This is a graph that you have already seen before. It's a graph that I was telling you. When they are comparing alternatives, whether or not they, they, they can discriminate the alternatives depends on the difference between the magnitude of the quantities. When, when the difference is big, that means the ratio is small, they are good at discriminating. When the ratio is uh, closer to one, then it becomes a much harder problem. Could this basic finding explain our results? We think it can, and I told you before that bananas and carrots have a different values. The values that I will put here are not the exact values of the food. It is, this is an hypothesis, okay, that could explain the findings that you see here. But we have not estimated whether 
uh, banana, the value of banana is 100 compared to carrot is 10. I suspect it's even less, meaning that carrot is even lower than 10. But Okay, so confronted with this situation, what the subject, if the subject is analyzing what is the total value of, of each of these options, it has to compare 100 versus 110. Pretty close in value. If we go to this other option, they prefer bananas to grapes, and here the comparison would be between 100 and 150. Notice that the difference between the quantities uh, is, is, uh, is closer here. The value here is closer. And finally, when we change the, um, when we change the composition of, of the pairs that we are comparing, what we see is now this is much uh, the 150 versus 50. Okay? So when we compare this one and this one, there is practically no difference. It's between 100 and 110. That difference, they may not be able to discriminate. But when we get to a difference of 150 versus 50, the discrimination is much easier. We think that this hypothesis could explain why individuals, when presented with a situation in which they could uh, benefit more by choosing the option with more items, they don't. This is the first case where Math trumps logic. If you use a logical operation, what you would do is you would say, of these two alternatives, these two are equal. Therefore, anything extra, I should go for that option. But this does not seem to be what they are doing. What they are doing is they are computing what is the total value of the two options and then deciding. Okay. Can we find evidence of these? computation in other work. This is the second example I will use. And in this example, I show you up till now, I show you how they were comparing quantities, quantities that they could see. I also told you that you could show one quantity, cover it, show the other quantity, cover it. But for this, it's all the same. It's they are comparing quantities. Now we are going to present them, uh, present them with a harder problem. A problem in which they cannot directly compare the quantities. Or if they compare quantities, they be, they'll be wrong. What we are going to do is we're going to request from them to compare probabilities. And the way this task works is as follows. There are two trays. And, each, and in each of these two trays, we put a different number of cups. Okay, so in this case, you have six cups. And in this tray, you have two cups. These cups are opaque. They cannot see inside. At first, we show them all these cups are empty. Okay? And now, after they've seen that this is empty, what we do is we, we bring a barrier, and then we take two cups from here. There were six. We put two cups on top of this barrier, and then we introduce two pieces of food. So here. So we started with six. We put the occluders on top of the platform, and now we take two cups, and we put one piece and another piece. The subject sees all these, okay? And for this other option, we take one cup, and this, the chimpanzee sees one piece disappearing on this cup. After we do that, we take these cups, we put them back in, and then we remove the occluders, and now the chimpanzee can choose. Notice that if the chimpanzee goes for which of the two trays has more food, it should choose this one, because there are two pieces of food there. Also, one thing that is important is the chimpanzee knows that it can choose one tray, and then it can choose one cup, only one cup. It's not that you choose one tray and you get everything on the tray. Okay? It's you can choose one tray, and then you can choose one cup. Uh, so this is the task. Okay? So we show how many cups are we playing with, how much food we introduce, and then after we place the food behind the occluder, now the subject can decide which one of these two options it wants. One thing that we found in this study with Daniel Hanos, here what you have is the correct choice. Correct choice means what is the, 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 higher, the, the, the better uh, option, the higher probability. And here what you see is that subjects 
are good at solving this task, but this depends on the probability ratio. This is based on what is the probability of the, of the low probability alternative divided by the probability of the high uh, probability alternative. And if you do that, then you can see a nice graph that reminds us of the one that we saw when the individuals were operating on quantities. Okay? But this is not the main finding I wanted to tell you about. The main finding that I wanted to tell you about is in here. And in here, what you have is you have some trials in which one of the options is absolutely safe. It's absolutely safe because there is only one cup. So you put one piece of food in one cup. If you choose that one, you will always be correct. You cannot go wrong. There is no empty cup. And in this, in this bracket of these this, uh, this, uh, probabilities, this probability ratio, you have different types of trials. And here you have very different types of trials. If individuals were using logic, what you would expect is that in this, they should be 100%. Because they should never choose the option, the tray that has some empty cups. Pick the tray that has no empty cups. But that's not what they do. The way they seem to solve the problem is by applying, they, they calculate the probability of getting it right, and then they use this to decide whether, which one is safer to choose. If they had applied not this algorithm, but they had applied the logic, they would have gotten in those special trials, these ones, they would have gotten it right every time. This is the second time that we found something like this. The first time we found it is in this other task. And very, very briefly, I'll tell you how it works. This is a task, again, that we tested all the great apes. And here, subjects have to choose between risky and safe options. The way it works is this. There is a tray. And in this tray, there are two types of cups. There is what we call a safe cup, the yellow one. And then there are the, the risky cups. The safe option is there is always going to be a piece of food here. And the subject sees that we put a piece of food there. And then we are going to hide another piece of food in one of these blue cups. But the subject doesn't know which one. So the way we play the game is the subject sees how many cups we are playing with. It also sees the safe cup. And then on top of this, we place food. The food that we place in the risky cups is what we call a unit. It's you know, one unit of banana. And then the safe option that we place here varies in size. In some cases, it's one sixth, uh, one third, or two thirds of the unit. Why do we do that? Because if we put this, the, the biggest option in this one, they will always choose it. And the game would be very good for them. They will get lots of food, but it would not be very informative for us. So if you want to get the biggest possible banana, you need to take risks. If you want to be conservative and get a banana for sure, much smaller than the other one, then you can pick this option. So what we manipulated, as I said, is the size of the reward and how many cups we use. You see here, we use four, four blue cups, but that range between four, three, two, and, this is crucial, one blue cup. Don't worry about the numbers. I just want to show you this graph. In this graph, these are the different combinations of quantities as a function of the size of the safe reward. And the, the reason I'm showing you this graph is because of this. What I, the circle there, this corresponds to this data. This is those cases in which the probability of netting the big reward is one. 
okay? Because there is only one risky cup. So when there is only one risky cup, you should always choose it because you are, get, you are going to get more food than if you pick the safe cup, okay? What you see here is that when the quantities are um, small or medium, they're doing quite well, but here is where they break down. When the quantity of the safe reward is two-thirds of the reward under a single blue cup, that's where they start to change. But it is precisely on those trials that they should always choose the blue cup because there is only one and because there is more food under the blue cup than in the yellow cup. So it's the same result that I showed you earlier. They seem to be doing the calculations in terms of how many cups are available and second, uh, how big is the size of the reward under the yellow cup. The take home message. Two things I would like to say. One is about the processing mechanisms. There have been a number of processing mechanisms, for, this is for quantity, that have been postulated over the years. 20 or so years ago, sabotaging was a very popular mechanism. And this is a mechanism that it was thought to have a limit of about between four and seven items, depending on the studies. Seven is, is a number that was usually used. And it was purely perceptual. Subjects had to be able to see the, the quantities in order to apply this mechanism. Now we know that they can solve problems even without seeing the, uh, the quantities simultaneously. I show you some of that. And second, they can do it beyond seven, which means that this mechanism cannot account for a sizable amount of data available today. There is another competing uh, system, or complementary if you want in some cases, which is the object file system. This system is much more exact than the analog magnitude system, but it operates on a much narrower range. It is said that beyond four, individuals start to uh, make mistakes. Recall that I said that the analog magnitude system, it is more approximate, but it can apply to a range of tasks. When I look at the data available in the literature, much of the data available in the literature on non-human animals can be accounted for by invoking the analog magnitude system. There is some data that doesn't seem to be explained by, by this, and then it is the object file system that, that could be the explanation. But by far, I think the analog magnitude system is the one that you see most often, I would say. The signature of this system you see most often. A crucial finding, the finding that I wanted to share with you today is that the magnitude of the difference between quantities determines discriminability. This is something, this is a rule, this is an algorithm that they apply to quantities. I gave you some examples of that. It is, a, it is a rule that they apply to probabilities, the last two problems that I showed you. And we think that it explains the results on the going to the store and choosing between the two TVs. In, in, uh, in, some, um, in my field, this is known as the natural choice task. So we think that we can explain these surprising results by invoking the difference in magnitude between the quantities that are being compared as an explanation for, um, for the results that are obtained. All these are good things, that's why I have them in blue, but at the same time, these mechanisms come at a cost. And the cost and is that over applied or not applied when other mechanisms like logic could be applied, it leads to some mistakes, mistakes that could be avoided. Mistakes that could be avoided in the case of when you have a single cup, then you have certainty on a choice, and you should stop using the, uh, the, 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 uh, the estimation, okay? I show you two of the simplest 
two of the simplest things that you can do in terms of math and logics and the precursors for our, our abstract forms of mathematics, of mathematical reasoning and, uh, and inferential reasoning. I also show you two cases where math trumps logic when applying logic in those cases would be more beneficial. But I think the reason we see this is because it's the type of the way the subjects are uh, operating on the quantities in order to solve the problem. In terms of uh, quantitative cognition, there, as, as I said, this was a, the, the very basic. There is studies, more studies on relative numerousness. Some of them have used numerals uh, associated with different quantities. Uh, as I was saying, the analog magnitude system works well. And uh, this, it's, I've been talking about uh, primates and, and non-human great apes, uh, but also uh, I think Irene Pepperberg was here for one of the talks. She has done very elegant work with uh, Alex uh, the parrot and on terms of relative numerousness and some of the operations that go beyond the basic ones that I showed you. There is also some, some data is starting to accumulate on intuitive statistics. One thing to keep in mind is that this, this literature goes hand in hand with the literature on infant uh, cognition. Uh, the, some of these tasks, for instance, the intuitive statistics are borrowed from that. And in this situation, the subject, uh, what, what, what we measure is whether an individual can use uh, uh, populations to infer the nature of a sample that will be extracted from this population. That is, can individuals go from populations to samples? At the moment, we are doing the reverse. We are studying whether individuals can go from uh, samples to inferring the nature uh, and the composition of populations. Also, there are studies on gambling. And in these studies, the, the most interesting thing is that you give subjects a piece of food that they can eat if they want. But if they prefer, they can exchange it for a chance of getting something better. But sometimes what they get is worse. And they need to decide based on the alternative available, does it pay to trade this piece of food that is in their hand for something that it is not? So uh, again, in this task, they take into account the number of options available and the quantity that is available in each option. I'll show you. I think I, I'm, this, this is a fascinating study. And I'm going to show you a video to see, to, so you see how it works. OK, so here you're going to see Amelie is going to be working with an orangutan. So OK, so Amelie is showing the orangutan. The orangutan is coming now. It's not, it's an, it's not an invisible orangutan, OK? Or an imaginary one. So she's coming here. OK, now the orangutan takes a look. And now there is this option. And this, this is the option that the experimenter is going to give to the orangutan. This is what we call a medium-sized cookie. Okay? Now, the orangutan, if, if, if she desires to do so, it can eat it. And if she eats it, the trial is over. We go to the next trial. But another thing that the orangutan can do is when Amelie requests, the orangutan can return the piece of food. And it returns this piece of food for a chance of getting one of these options. Which option is given to the orangutan is randomly designed, is randomly assigned. It's not something that you decide. I'm going to give you the bigger one. Uh, there, this is predetermined. And then if the orangutan returns a medium-sized cookie, it can get, sometimes you will see the combinations are much bigger, sometimes are the same size, but sometimes are much smaller. So this is a game where you can win, but you can also lose. And notice that in this case, the orangutan doesn't need to do that because the orangutan already has some food in her hand that she could eat. One thing the orangutans try to do sometimes is they take a little nibble and then they try to exchange. No, no, we don't do that. As soon as you take a nibble, that's it. That's your food. OK. So now, here, this is, this is the way it works. And now orangutans are presented. We did two different studies. Uh, the results are, are very similar. And now the orangutan is confronted with different options uh, and, and different trials. The orangutan, for instance, in the option number one, the orangutan can decide, do I exchange my medium-sized cookie for a chance of getting one of these? So what you have here, whoops, sorry. 
What you have here is you have large, medium, and small. So if you are dealing with these four, you should always exchange because you can never lose. If you're, do if you're dealing with this combination, you should never exchange because you are going to lose for sure and everything in between. What we found is that monkeys and orangutans, and some species are better than others, are sensitive to these. So here what you have is the probability of winning, and as you can see, as the probability of winning decreases, the probability that they exchange food that they already have in their hand is reduced. This is study one. Study two produces some of the same result. Um, anyway, I just wanted to show you this to illustrate that what I show you can be taken one step further. And I will, I will do, 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 here, here. Okay, I will go here. What is true about other quantitative abilities is also true of inferential reasoning. I show you some of the simplest ones, but there are also uh, operations that are based on inference by exclusion and operations that require causal inference. Again, I mean, this is, this is uh, work that has been done that is beyond the basics that I wanted to communicate to you today. I want to finish with this slide with my collaborators. Uh, and, uh, in highlighted in blue are the people that have been instrumental in developing each of these paradigms. Thank you very much. <laughs>